We are live. Welcome. This is, I believe, the 65th Scripture Roundtable uh, put on by the Interpretive Foundation. This one is dedicated to Lesson 15 in the 2014 Gospel Doctrine Manual, which is the Old Testament manual, and this lesson is, titled, is entitled Look to God and Live. It covers, essentially, uh, Numbers 11 through 14 and uh, part of Numbers 21 in the Old Testament. Uh, this is the section where the children of Israel are out in the wilderness um, and the people murmur. There's a great deal of murmuring in these chapters, a lot of discontent uh, as they think back on those glorious days in Egypt. You know, it's, it's, it's always easy to romanticize the past. The glorious days in Egypt weren't all that nice. They were in captivity and being worked to the bone. But in retrospect, gosh, you kind of forget all that stuff. And wasn't it nice? We had good food to eat. And life, was, life was pleasant. This bit out here in the desert is pretty miserable. So uh, chapter 11 begins, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. That's pretty much the leitmotif through, uh, through all these chapters. The Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the outermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Um, so you have this continual dynamic of the Lord becoming angry with the children of Israel, and Moses interceding on their behalf. Um, and it says in verse 4, uh, The mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlics. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. They were happy to get it at first, but pretty sick of it now. And I can say, those uh, those foods, I lived in Egypt for four years with my wife. Um, yeah, cucumbers, melons, onions, garlic, uh, fish, lots of it there. That's, uh, that's the kind of thing you eat there. Um, but not so much in the Sinai Desert. Just isn't a lot out there. Um, so, uh, Martin, uh, oh, I didn't introduce who's with us tonight. Um, with us we have, I'm Daniel Peterson, uh, Martin Tanner, who will be handling the technical aspects of our program and contributing, and Craig Foster. Um, and Martin, I believe you had, uh, you looked up a, a different translation for that mixed multitude phrase. I got a kick out of it. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> yeah, there, uh, the, the contemporary English version has for chapter 11, verse 4, this translation. One day some worthless foreigners among the Israelites became greedy for food, and even the Israelites themselves began moaning, we don't have any meat. And so <laughs> this is obviously <laughs> Egyptians who came with them or some of their foreigners who are considered worthless according to this translation. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, but you know, they're, they're yearning for the good old days, and, uh, and this is a continual thing. But how does Moses react? Uh, in verse 13, it's kind of interesting. He goes to the Lord and he complains. He's really sick of it. He's had to handle these whining, complaining people for a long time already, and it's going to go on much longer. Um, verse 13, he says, when should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight. Let me not see my wretchedness. <laughs> just, just kill me. I'm so sick of leading these people in the wilderness. If, if you like me, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> do me do me a favor. Um, obviously, the Lord doesn't do it. How does he react? Uh, well, he appoints helpers. So you get the... And by the way, Craig, Martin, jump in at any point you want to. Um, the Lord said unto Moses, verse 16, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may... Uh, stand there with me, and I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. So the idea is he gets him assistance. Um, right. 
because he really has been bearing a lot of the burden on his own. And uh, so by delegation, you know, basic managerial principle, can lessen the workload on the, the primary guy. He's still responsible, but he doesn't have to do all of it. And I noticed the number 70. Yes. Kind I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, kind of a uh, foreshadowing or whatever you want to call it of the, uh, of the 70 that, uh, that Jesus later appointed, um, yeah. uh, you know, called. And, um, and then, of course, we have in the, uh, in the church today, you know, we have uh, the Quorum of the 70. And as the church has expanded, we have expanded uh, in terms of the quorums, uh, and um, and so you know, I can only imagine what it would be like if um, if all of the church members had to go to President Monson, you know, about every little thing, and uh, and so you know, Moses uh, had seventy, uh, Jesus later called seventy. We have. Uh, we have the seven quorums of seventy. Uh, they're not all filled right now, I don't think. But it, but you know, we we're we're going that to direction because of uh, uh, of the members of the church, and and so you, you at least I I saw significance, kind of like you did, in the number seventy, and that it has it has been repeated in different dispensations. Yeah. There are certain numbers that are significant in the scriptures. 1, mm -hmm. 3, 7, 12, uh, 40, I suppose, 70, 144. Um, yes. I've sometimes heard it said that, well, you have the 12 tribes, so 12 is significant in that regard. The 70 represent the traditional 70 nations of the earth, you know. Now, whether they do in this case or not, I don't know, but I think they're clearly connected these 70 with the 70 in the New Testament and right. the 70 then in the in the modern church today. Um, and I know when I, for example, was serving as a bishop, it was so wonderful to have two good counselors. And and if you could find a good Relief Society president, good elders quorum president, and so on, they lifted so much of the burden from you because you just can't do it all. And there were certain things where you just say, can you take care of this? And you know, you'd know that it would be taken care of it's off your really? plate. Uh, that would have been a great relief to Moses, too, uh, dealing with these people, even had they been easy to deal with, but they weren't. Um, so he's <laughs> constantly struggling with them, and uh, just to have some other people to listen to their whining, you know, <laughs> that would be a, a step forward for him, I think. Um, yeah. So, uh, anyway, Martin, again, if you have anything you want to say, feel free. Um, a couple of quick little comments. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. One is that um, this whole idea of 70 has, has been an important number from the earliest days, even with the scriptures themselves. The Septuagint, according to yes. tradition, is uh, the product uh, in Greek of 70 translators, which went off and came back word for word with the same translation, of course. Yeah. That, that's probably a, a slight exaggeration, but the gist of it is that this is a perfect number with perfect results that come by God. That's the underlying message from, from, from that story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. These numbers aren't by chance. They had symbolic significance. Um, well, the Lord continues. He's not done speaking to Moses. He says, And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. And ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Um... So, um, <laughs> you know, the Lord says, all right, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much meat, you'll be sick of meat. You're sick of manna now. He's, you know, and you think, well, why is he treating them so roughly? I think, I think these years in the wilderness were an attempt to really train a people so that there will be some momentum when they finally get settled in, in Canaan. 
they'll have a, a history, a past, and a cultural habit of obedience and respect to the Lord. And I'd have to say that even after all the, the flaws of Israel, even after it settled in the Holy Land, obviously this, this experiment was successful to a large extent. Figure the Jews still exist as a, as a people. Uh, maybe not on the right track, but they still exist as a people conscious of their heritage when every ancient society around them has long since lost its identity. Uh, right. So it was a long training process, and it was designed to sort of beat it into their heads. Yeah, you know, the chosen people. You know, I, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but, of course, um, we have where... Um, the, the the men are sent in to uh, to spy out uh, uh, Canaan, and um, they spend forty days uh, doing so, and then return. and And we we know all of that story, and we have uh, where uh, basically God uh, condemns that generation to to die away in the desert before the next generation can enter into their promised land. And I. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the fact that um, that they had to they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, the generation died out, and then the next generation came along. But the the thought crossed my mind, and and it has crossed my mind before as I've read this. Um, what would have happened if God had said? Well, okay, I'm really unhappy that you you had such a negative report, but we're going to go in anyway, and I'm going to have you uh, conquer Palestine now, and it's it, or, or you know Canaan now, and it and it uh, just your comment made me once again think of that. Would they have survived? Yeah. Would they have been able to do what they did? And I don't think so, personally. I I really don't. Right. And I, I think they needed that 40 years uh, to get rid of the generation that had lived in slavery and, quite frankly, could not, to a great degree, think for themselves. They had no experience of, of being free, of being in control, and thinking for themselves, acting, and also knowing when to follow the prophet. And uh, so it needed to be that this this new generation grew up learning these things that uh, so that they were in a position to uh, accomplish what they did. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, well, Moses hears they're going to be given meat, and uh, this is the people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen. Now, <coughs> excuse me. We've we've talked about the numbers before. This is probably pretty high, but but whatever it is, it's a big number, and they're in the middle of a very barren area. Whether you think it's the Sinai Peninsula that we know today, or as I somewhat suspect, on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, the Gulf of Elat, over in what is today Saudi Arabia, the two areas are virtually identical. They are desert. I mean, they make Nevada look like a tropical rainforest, and so, um, so you know, Moses says, "Oh, great, you're going to give them meat." Uh, there are 600,000 footmen. Thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? I mean, okay, nice plan. You're going to give them all this meat. Where am I supposed to get it? Shall the, um, and the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. In other words, don't you worry. I'm not asking you to provide it. I will provide it. So um, anyway, he goes out and he tells the uh, the people what has been said. He gathers the seventy elders together, brings them the tabernacle, and that's fulfilled. Uh, and then this story. I I think Craig, you wanted to say something about this in verse twenty six. Um, or was it there? It was uh, verse twenty nine. Oh, 29. Yeah, well, it comes yeah. at the end of that story. Yeah. Um, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the, and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Yeah. And they were um, they were of them that were written, but uh, went not out unto the tabernacle. They prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses, said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the young men, who's, of course, going to 
rise to quite illustrious heights later, answered and said, my lord Moses, forbid them. He's jealous of Moses' prerogatives. Moses is the prophet. You know, these men have, men have no right to prophet, uh, prophesy. And Moses said unto him, envious thou for my sake, who were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Right. Um, yeah, I really like that uh, verse because, um, you know, it, I think there's a message there for, for all of us. Um, you know, when Moses said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets? Uh, you know, I think you, you, you use... You take that scripture and you look at other scriptures and then you you look at this dispensation. And some of the things that Joseph Smith uh, uh, said, uh, one of which was, you know, uh, when, when a person asked Joseph how he could control all these people, and uh, he, you know, he said, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. Right. Um, I think ultimately that's what God wants. God wants us all to be prophets in that we are um, in the right frame of mind spiritually, um, uh, you know, intellectually, emotionally, that we receive prophecy, uh, revelation for ourselves, for our families, um, bishops for the wards. In other words, um, we, uh, for whomever we are responsible and, uh, you know, I think Thomas S. Monson would probably say the same thing, that he wished that every person in this church was a prophet or a prophetess in terms of uh, being in the correct frame of mind to receive revelation. Yeah, it's like what I was saying before, you know, that there's nothing better than to have a counselor or an associate who doesn't need to be told every step to take. I mean, an, an obedient right. one is, is good, but, but one who actually sees the problems and takes steps to meet them, to deal with them, handles his or her own stewardship really well without needing instruction for every detail. Uh, that's Absolutely. the best kind of, uh, of associate or assistant or employee to have where you say, okay, you take care of this and you know that it's going to be taken care of. And that would right. have taken such a load off Moses' mind. He's not upset that they're prophesying. He wants them to have the spirit. Right. So, Absolutely. Martin, Martin uh, any observations on this? A uh, quick little observation. One of the underlying themes, although it's never quite said this way, is that happiness is a choice. I And the people here are, are choosing because of their background to just whine and complain about everything. I, I have a friend whose name I won't mention who, if you started to recite his background, would just about make anyone cry. He was in a truck accident and after being a marathon runner in his uh, youth and 20s, after this truck accident, he was in a wheelchair. Because wow. he was in a wheelchair, he was unable to provide well for his family and his wife divorced him and left mm. and moved to Australia with his children, whom he has rarely seen since. And uh, in the last several years, his, his mother's passed away, who was his closest friend, and uh, some other family members, for one reason or another, have refused to talk to him. He's a pretty happy guy. Hmm. You call him up on the phone, he would smile. He'd tell you about how uh, people kind of chuckle driving by his home because he has a snowblower that he uh, holds in front of his wheelchair and he plows his own driveway. I mean, he does some oh incredible thing because he's happy and he just doesn't quite take, I can't do it for, for a frame of mind. And the underlying message to me of, of uh, the Exodus and Numbers and the reason, the underlying reason why the generation had to pass away is because they were complainers. They were not happy. People. Yeah. They were not grateful to God for everything they had. They get manna, they whine because they don't have meat. They get quail, they, they, want, it, they always find something to be unhappy about. And yeah. God is never 
pleased with that. He wants us all to choose happiness and be grateful for what we have, not wish we had more. Yeah. You know, I, I knew someone, and I won't go into detail about where I knew him or anything. I don't want to give away his identity, but he reminded me of the character in uh, Peanuts, and I can't remember which one it was, who walks around and he always has a cloud over his head and it's always raining on him. <laughs> I mean, it was no matter what the external circumstances were, he was griping all the time. And he finally moved away, and he went to a new place because he was so sick of where he was. And I saw him a couple of years later and asked him how he was doing. I already knew the answer. Oh, he hated where he was. Just hated it. Everybody here was such a jerk, and they're all creeps, and you know that sort of thing. And I thought, I could have predicted this. In fact, I think I did. That it had nothing to do with external circumstances. You know, obviously, external circumstances can cause you a lot of grief. But to a large extent, it is a choice, <clears throat> how you want to react. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, these people choose to, uh, to react with whining. Um, and I'm sure it was tough out there in the desert. And Manna probably did get monotonous, but good grief. You're being miraculously fed every day in an intractable wilderness where there is virtually no water, no plants. This is astonishing. You've been delivered yeah. nonviolently from bondage. Um, and still you complain. Uh, well, anyway, so what happens, of course, is then quails come and uh, <clears throat> in vast quantities uh, and land on the ground so they can go out and get as much quail as they want. That won't please them, of course. Uh, but there are other people who complain. Uh, starting in chapter 12, it's not just the mixed multitude and a bunch of anonymous Israelites. The complaining happens within Moses' own family. Um, you know, Miriam and Aaron uh, spake against Moses. He married some Ethiopian woman, a Cushite woman, the Hebrew says. Um, well, apparently that irritates them, though we don't know exactly why. Um, <clears throat> and then they say, well, has the Lord spoken only by Moses? He's spoken by us, too. And, uh, and then it, there's an interesting note here. It says, um, in, parenthetically, now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That interests me because I think when we normally think of the term meek, we think kind of, of well, weak. Um, Casper Milktoe, spineless, you know, humble, quiet. But that doesn't fit Moses. He's meek, I think, in a different sense. He's, he's meek for himself. But he's absolutely fearless in declaring the word of the Lord. Yes. So, you know, he's not arrogant. He's, he's humble enough to listen to the Lord and take guidance from the Lord. But not meek in the negative sense that we often use that word. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. They three came out. This is not good when you've just been railing against the prophet. <laughs> And the Lord suddenly calls all three of you out. Come out here, I want to talk to you. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. They both came forth, somewhat hesitantly, I'm sort of guessing. And he said, Hear now my word. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him... Will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently? And that means, you know, openly. Um, it's not just dreams. It's not subtle inspirations. I talk to him face to face. In other words, he's of a different status than you are. Have you gotten inspiration? Yeah, you have. But Moses is a different species. <laughs> You're not on the same level. Um, so, uh, not in dark speeches. The similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Do you not realize how special Moses is? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron you know, says, please, um, help, we've done foolishly. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed. And then Moses intercedes again. Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. So it's Moses again, not just for Israel, not just for the mixed multitude, but for his own brother and sister who've rebelled against him in a way. 
um, he has to intervene on and intercede on their behalf, and um, and so Miriam is shut out of the camp as a leper for a few days, but eventually she comes back and she's okay. But I suspect chastened somewhat. She's learned a bit. So again, I've done all the talking on this chapter, guys. Anything you'd like to observe about this? Well, um, you know, the uh, once again. Um, <coughs> talking about numbers that have significance. The, uh, if I remember correctly, she was out of the camp for seven days. Yeah. And it was after seven days that she was able to come back in. So once again, we see the use of, um, of uh, one of these special uh, numbers. And, and uh, I, I think it, it just kind of reinforces it uh, that uh, that uh, this was something special. It was special in that uh, here's Miriam, who who obviously has been a very important uh, person for Moses and for the people of Israel, uh, but she was wrong, and Aaron was wrong, and they had to repent. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, God would smite her with uh, leprosy, I think, uh, shows how significant it was um, how wrong she was. Here Moses depended upon these two for support, and they even turned against uh, him for a short time. And, and so, you know, her punishment was to have leprosy, uh, but God showed his mercy and made it only seven days that, that she had that leprosy. Right, right. Martin? Quick, quick thought here. One of the other underlying messages that I think we see um, through these chapters, as well as many before and after, is that God will listen to a righteous prayer for something positive. Even though Miriam and Aaron have murmured, even though the children of Israel have murmured over and over and over again, when Moses intercedes, God listens to, to what Moses does because he has prayed and sought God's guidance in humility, as, as Danny pointed out earlier. And um, uh, that's when God grants blessings, is when people pray and actually ask for something that's good. And we see that over and over here because if that prayer had never been offered it would have been the status quo, which was not a great status quo. Right. Right. Well, now we move into uh, chapter 13, where Moses sends 12 spies to search, out, search around in the land of Canaan and get a sense of what the place looks like. This is a, in response to divine command. And they come back with mixed reports. Um, <laughs> there are 10 of them who come back saying, yeah, it's a pretty nice place, but good grief. People there are giants. We'll never be able to take them. And what they have to say is very disheartening to a people who are already saying, gee, why couldn't we have been left in the flesh pots of Egypt? You know, Now we come out here and we're going to be wiped out by giants. After wandering around in the desert, now we're all going to die. Um, there are two men who come back significantly, Caleb and Joshua. His name is given in a slightly different form here, but it's Joshua. Um, who who report positively and say, but we can take them. Now, I don't know that that's arrogance on their part so much as it is confidence in the Lord. Um, come on, good grief, you escaped the armies of Pharaoh, and the, the sea opened up to let you pass. Manna has been dropping out of the sky. Show a little confidence here. Uh, the Lord hasn't abandoned you, but um, the ten of the twelve lack the faith. That's the key, um, and I I just find that amazing. The, you you you've already mentioned all the miracles they've witnessed, and they they don't think that um, God can fight their battles for them. Um, of course, it's easy for me sitting back in 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 the armchair reading the scriptures to say, "What's your problem, folks?" You know, but um, uh, but I. Ask that. What's your problem? Uh, after having seen all those miracles, uh, but uh, you know we we can relate it to today, and I'll get to that later. But um, 
You know, it's easy for us to judge, and yet uh, I, I, I know there are times when probably uh, our, our descendants will say, what was the problem? <laughs> Why didn't you have faith? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, you're right. I mean, it's easy to sit and criticize them from our comfortable armchairs. We're sitting in, you know, under electric light and air conditioned or heated homes and, you know, comfortable chairs and, yeah, why don't you go out to battle? Um, <laughs> but, but I have to say, these weren't just ordinary people plucked off the street. They have already seen impressive miracles. The ten plagues of Egypt, uh, crossing the Dead Sea, the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke that goes before them, the manna from heaven. They do have some sense of the Lord's track record, you know, um, and they still don't trust him. It, um, right. it reminds me a little bit on a smaller scale of, of Laman and Lemuel, you know, just mm. within minutes of seeing an angel are back to saying, we can't do this. Um, we can't go up against Laban and that sort of thing. And you just you just had a conversation with an angel. Come on. Um, but um, but that's it. It's not blind faith. It, it, uh, the Lord's not asking for that. He's given them reason to trust him, and they still don't trust. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> well, um, I guess, unless, Martin, you have something you want to say about Chapter 13, we might move on. Um one quick comment in general about yeah. this. <clears throat> as, as people read through this, um, they, they see things, and I'll, I'll come back to the contemporary English version here because it's kind of fun to read a different version. This is the last um, verse in chapter 13. This is the report when the men come back. In fact, we saw the Nephilim, who are the ancestors the, of the Anakim, and they are so big that we felt as small as grasshoppers. And you have earlier the, the fiery serpents and, and you have all these descriptions. I think we tend to read these um, a, a little bit too literally. It's probably uh, quite likely, as I've read in a few uh, good Bible commentaries, that these are instances of hyperbole. You know, Moses, when he prays to God and says, kill me now, pr probably that, that was a, a bit figurative and, and use of hyperbole, where we exaggerate things. How many times have I asked you to clean up your room? A million times. Well, <laughs> a million, you know, we just use hyperbole for, to, to make a point or to emphasize things, and that seems to be what's going on here over and over and over again, where the serpents really fiery, they were probably poisonous and, and dangerous, and the use of the term fire that, that was uh, something that was to be feared unless it was controlled made a point. And, and so as you read through things, you don't have to think that it's so different from what we encounter today that it's hard to believe or hard to be uh, yeah. understood. Yeah, yeah. That's an important point to understand, I think. Um, um, well, you know, these guys at one point come back with a, a huge uh, load of grapes on a staff, two men carrying it. It's a bunch of grapes. I might mention that if you go to Israel today, you'll still see uh, cars around Jerusalem and I think Tel Aviv too, um, mostly Jerusalem because that's where the tourists go. Uh, and the symbol on the side of the car, which I believe they're from the Ministry of Tourism, is two guys in outline carrying a staff and an enormous cluster of grapes about the size of a good-sized man hanging between them. Uh, and then you have the talk of the land flowing with milk and honey. Um, I, I have to admit, I've always wondered if, if uh, someone with a real estate background didn't uh, have a hand in that phrase. <laughs> Because another instance of hyperbole. <laughs> yeah, I mean it ain't that nice, but uh, I suspect if you're coming from the from the Sinai Desert, yeah, it looks pretty good. They've got water. <laughs> There's green there. Um, but uh, you know, somebody coming from I don't know Tahiti might not be so impressed. Um, but you know, relatively speaking, it was a it was a fairly good area because it had reliable rainfall and a river and and things like that, but, um, you know, they've they've spent their time having left Egypt, which is also pretty lush in the Nile Valley. The minute you leave the Nile Valley, you are in the dead zone. There's just nothing out there. It's unbelievable how barren it is. Um, and, 
I don't know if I've mentioned in one of these roundtables before or not, but one of the places that most impresses me is to the south of Cairo at a place called Saqqara where the Step Pyramid is. And you drive up out of the Nile Valley to see the Step Pyramid. And I always point it out to people when I've taken them there, <clears throat> the, uh, the green area of the Nile Valley just stops abruptly. That's it. You could stand, in theory at least, with one foot in the green and one foot in the Sahara Desert. It's that abrupt. It doesn't peter out. It just stops. And it's desert from there to the Atlantic Ocean. Thousands of miles of desert. And, um, and that's the kind of landscape they're in. So, you know, Canaan would look pretty nice, relatively speaking, I think. Uh, the same way probably Bountiful looked great to, the, to Lehi and his party after... Eight years or so, or whatever it was, in in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so, chapter fourteen. Um, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Here we go again. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, "Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword?" that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. It's a rebellion. It's Literally, it's in the Greek, it's an apostasy. I mean, apostasy means rebellion. Um, and um, they want to go back. They want to go back to Egypt. Um, so... Um, Joshua is encouraging. He said, Caleb, too. And they said, come on, we can, we can do this. The Lord brought us here. You know, we can take this country that we've been given by the Lord. Uh, just don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. They're bread for us, you know, and we can eat them up. Um, their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade uh, stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared. And then the Lord says to Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with a pestilence and disinherit them. And will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So now the thing is turned around. It's not Moses saying, Kill me! I'm sick of this! It's the Lord saying, I'm sick of this! I'm going to kill them all. I'm just going to destroy them. I'll create a family from you, you know. You, I'll give you a better people than these people. Let me just, let me just blot them off the face of the earth. And Moses, again, intercedes on behalf of his people. He says, "Don't do it." Because if it gets out to the Egyptians, for example, you led these people out into the wilderness only to kill them. What'll that do for your reputation? <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, and so the Lord works out a different deal, a sort of compromise, which is what. Well, he's going to kill him, <laughs> but, yeah. no. but he's, it's by I a shouldn't decision. say it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's back to what I had mentioned earlier. It was obviously that generation, they spiritually, emotionally, they were not in a position to go into uh, Canaan. And so, um, uh, you know, God was going to wait for a new generation to rise up that uh, that could be taught correctly and uh, to uh, to have more faith and and uh, you know and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Martin, anything on this? You know, I I think you've made the point. The people murmur; they're just not going to change, and God yeah. realizes it. Yeah, and he's going to deal with it in the only appropriate way that's yeah. left. Yeah, he's just going to—he's going to run out the clock, and uh, <laughs> and so Joshua and Caleb are going to make it into the promised land, yeah. but the rest of them aren't. Joshua and Caleb showed faithfulness, trust in him. They were confident, given what they'd seen. They had no doubt that um, that the Lord would prevail. But these others, they're just going to—their carcasses are going to fall by the wayside in the in the wilderness, um, and uh, and so that's the that's the solution. They're going to wander. They are there. They're right on the boundaries of the promised land. Yeah. But now they're going to head right back into the wilderness and be there for the remainder of forty years. 
Um, they could have inherited it, but they will not. And um, and so that's the idea. He wants to create a generation that will understand. It, you know, you just have to wipe the slate clean and and uh, take the younger, the kids that can be socialized. You know into the order that he wants them to be in, who will be ready for uh, occupying the Holy Land. Um, so... Um, is, um, is this a good place to, uh, to mention that, um, you know, I was, I was talking with my wife yeah. uh, um, about, uh, about what we were going to discuss uh, this evening, and, um, and, and I was struck by her comment, and I wish that I had thought of this myself, but as soon as she said it, then it kind of like, oh, yeah. And, you know, and her comment was, well, that's just like today. And, um, and, and it is, you know, we, you know, here we are, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're the church of God. We have a prophet. We have prophets. We have, uh, you know, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and other leaders, and yet, you um, you, you you see all around us um, uh, one issue or another, one group or another complaining about this, complaining about that. Uh, you know, second guessing uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the prophet, etc., and uh, and complaining, just basically complaining, complaining about one issue or another, complaining about. Uh, how tough this is, or how tough that is, and and I, you know, I mean, I'm not perfect. Uh, I, I think it's human nature to to second guess or to complain or whatever else. But um, you know, it's also we're here to overcome uh, the various aspects of of uh, of second nature, man's second nature, or whatever the fallen man, um, and. Uh, you know, and we're all at different levels, but uh, but I think uh, uh, particularly in the in the last few years or so, I've I've seen a lot of this where um, there's just a number of uh, issues that people uh, are second guessing, complaining, and uh, and so you know they say uh, you know from the Book of Mormon we liken the scriptures unto ourselves. Well, unfortunately. We can also liken some of the not so happy moments of the scriptures unto ourselves. Right. In that, uh, you know, it's easy for us to judge the Israelites with all their complaining, but uh, we're doing the same thing uh, to one degree or another. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent point to make. The point of the scriptures, what is it? Is it is it Ambrose Beers or Mark Twain who says the Bible is a is an excellent book, admirably suited to the needs of my neighbor. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if we always read it as saying, you know, as, yeah, that's exactly what Fred does, you know, <laughs> uh, then we're not getting out of it where we're supposed to. We're supposed right. to be saying, wow, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. Um, I should not be doing that. I'm very much like that. I have that same tendency. It's um, it ought to be aimed at us first and foremost, likened unto us and unto our, us. Personally, specifically, I think, as we read this and we see people going off the rails, we should ask, "Do I do that?" And sometimes the answer has to be, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. Sometimes I do. In fact, yeah. sometimes, in certain cases, it's something I do very often. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, the scripture is very honest in that regard. They show you the good and the bad. They show you the human side of, of even good people who who fail. Um, so there's a great deal to be learned from them, I think. Now, there are some people who realize they've made a mistake. Um, at the end of chapter 14, they rose up early in the morning, got them under, up under the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? It shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. Um, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed, and I think that word presumed is important, they presumed to go up unto the hill, unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. He's not going to support them in this. 
they decide, well, okay, we were wrong to say we couldn't conquer the land, so we'll go up. Now, without the Lord's authorization, he's told them, you know, you've missed your chance. Well, they decide they're going to do it anyway. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, and smote them and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. So, you know, the fact is, <clears throat> when you do something that in other circumstances would be right, but you don't have the Lord's authorization to do it now, it's wrong. That's, I think that relates to so many issues. You know, uh, is right to ordain somebody? Yes, but only when that ordination is proper and done in an orderly fashion. I can't simply take it upon myself to ordain someone. There was a case many, many years ago where, uh, <clears throat> where a, a man in Portland ordained a black man in 1977, and he was excommunicated. And uh, 1978, I think it was 1978, uh, I mean, I think it was just a year later. I think that was in 77. The revelation came on priesthood, and then people, you know, were ordaining blacks with authorization. He complained about that, but of course, he was wrong to do what he'd done because he didn't have the authorization to do it. Um, and you could multiply that number of any number of times where people go ahead and do something that uh, that that might otherwise be right, but they don't have the authorization to do it, and the Lord is not with them. That's what happened in this case. Um, I don't know what's happened with Craig there. Martin, do you have any comments? I keep <laughs> running right over you. <laughs> I, I, I think you're great. Um, I have nothing else to really add to uh, Chapter 14. Okay. Well, now, by my reckoning, we have to jump ahead here to Chapter 21. Is that right? Uh, that's true. You, you know what? Let me... I do have one quick little thing that, I'm, yeah. that I want to add here. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have, should have said something before. And, and that is that um, at the end of Chapter 15 which is technically not in the lesson, except that we're kind of bridging the gap here. Yeah. Um, there's this really interesting uh, few verses, verses 37 through 41. And I'll read from the uh, contemporary English version again in a minute. If you recall the story in the New Testament of the woman with an issue of blood who touched, as it says in the King James Version, the hem of Jesus' garment, if you read that in in the Hebrew, it says that she reached up and touched the tassel of his garment. It was a tassel. He perceived that virtue um, had left him, power had left him. And and the question is, if, if you read that, well, why would Jesus have a tassel on his garments? What's the point of, of the tassel? And um, here it is in, in the last few verses of chapter 15 where God tells the people of Israel, sew a tassel on the bottom edge of your clothes and tie a purple string to it. These will remind you that you must obey me and my law and my teachings and dedicate yourselves to me and not your own sinful desires. Jesus was being a very observant Jew in his dress and his uh, clothing because he did exactly what was required by the end of verse 15 here in, in Numbers. Yeah. little trivia, and we can move on. Yeah. I, that's a good point. Good point. You know, and for a long time, by the way, <clears throat> uh, Christians kind of ignored the fact that Jesus was Jewish. Uh, it's only been in the last couple of generations the scholars have begun to write books like Jesus the Jew. I mean, after all, it turns out he wasn't actually Norwegian. <laughs> um, <laughs> he he was Jewish, and he lived life as a, as an observant Jew, um, which is an important point. And that's a, you can understand more of what he's doing, I think, against that background. Um, well, we have only the first nine verses, really, of um, of of Numbers twenty one to talk about, but they are really really interesting verses. Again, <clears throat> they complain, verse four. And they journeyed from Mount Hora by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. That's basically sort of down by the southeast of the, of the Dead Sea. Um, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I've been in that area. I can understand why they'd be much discouraged. It's pretty desolate. Uh, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? 
good grief, you'd think they'd get tired of this song. Um, For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. We are so sick of manna. Uh, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now, the the note here says um, poisonous serpents. Um, or, you know, poisonous might be a... You know, fiery is a pretty good way of, of describing it. I imagine that the pain was like fire uh, if they bit you. Um, they're fiery in that sense, but there's nothing magical about them. They're, um, they're poisonous snakes. There are a lot of poisonous snakes, and people were dying from them, going through this hellish wilderness um, and encountering poisonous snakes. I mean, just the icing on the cake, right? Um so many of them died. It wasn't just one or two. It was a fair number. And so then the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the, the serpents from us. And Moses prayed to the people. Again, it's the people whining, Moses interceding. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, that's an interesting story. But it's especially interesting uh, in the sense that it's been used a lot in in other scriptures. And it's it's taken as a symbol routinely in the Book of Mormon and the New Testament of what? Not just a story of healing against poisonous snakes in the desert, it comes to symbolize Christ. Uh, the Gospel of John says that even as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so Christ will be lifted up. And, and in effect, whoever looks to him, metaphorically, will live. And those who don't, won't. And uh, the Book of Mormon says that, that uh, many people continued to perish simply because they wouldn't look. It was too easy. Oh, come on. You know, look at a, at a brass serpent on a pole. What good's that going to do? Well, would have done them a whole world of good, but they wouldn't look because it was too easy. And there are lots of stories like that in the scriptures. You know, the uh, right. the the general out of Syria, you know, <laughs> who's told to go wash himself in the Jordan River, and he says, "Yeah, don't we have better rivers in Syria? I won't do that." And uh, you know, because uh, there's a good quote from the German poet Goethe. He said that. It irritates people that the truth is so simple. And, uh, you yeah, know, that's the way it is here. The Lord sets this up, and you just, all you have to do is look. You'll be okay. Will you do it? No. So, it's a powerful symbol, I think, and a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross. I agree. So, if you look to Christ, meaning look to his his atoning sacrifice in the garden and on the cross, you can be saved. Well, that's the thing, you know, and, and as you uh, emphasized, it was so simple to um, for the children of Israel to, to look to the, um, to the brass serpent up there on the, you know, on the pole. It is so simple to look to Christ and yet we make it so difficult yeah. at times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, One quick but, point, if I could jump in here, and, yeah. and that is that I think this illustrates um, in, in some of the more difficult times uh, earlier also that the children of Israel went through, that faith does not depend upon how hard or how simple things are, it depends on your belief and, and your attitude. Uh, other times, faith was really difficult. It, it might have been difficult to exercise faith to walk through uh, on dry land and, and believe that you could escape the Egyptians. They were a huge, powerful force um, because that might have been a really difficult thing to do. How difficult is it to look at a pole? Yeah. It is so simple, and yet both times they failed. It wasn't a matter of how easy or how hard. It was a matter of how much faith they had, and faith is the key. If you really have faith, you believe that anything is possible with God. If you have no faith, 
even simple things are impossible. Right. Right. I think um, you know we've we've actually gone fairly long tonight, and that may be a really good note to end on. Just I think that is the lesson, certainly yeah. the lesson that uh, that the manual wants us to get across is look to God and live, yeah. or you can look elsewhere and die, which is what literally happens in these cases. Um, may not happen literally to us, but um, but spiritually it will. Um, if we look to God, we can live, and that is that is the lesson of these chapters. Uh, whining and complaining and wanting to go back to Egypt and yearning for your old life of sin and, and so on isn't going to help you. But turning to God, you will eventually get to the promised land. It's just a question of how long it's going to take you to learn the lesson. So, yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation in, in the roundtable. Um, it's Martin Tanner and Craig Foster and myself, Dan Peterson, and uh, we're <clears throat> delighted to discuss these these uh, passages. They're wonderful things, I and mean, there's much more, obviously, than than we can talk about that's contained in these chapters. Uh, but we uh, we love discussing them, and we hope they're of use to people out there in the audience. And uh, we wish everyone the best. Thank you very much. <laughs>